months. I had two terrible, terrible concussions in 2012 and 2013. Traumatic brain injury. Like these are like car accidents? Uh, one was in a motocross accident on oh. a motocross track in Southern California. Someone hit me in the air off a 100, 100 foot jump. I spun around, cracked my helmet ear to ear, landed not on my bike, um, had all the concussion related issues that went away a year later in a wind and a skydiving tunnel. I had I hit my head in the exact same spot. Thought I broke my neck because I felt what, what I thought was acid running down my spine. And I thought any minute I'm going to be a quadriplegic. Welcome back to the Chris Crone show. Today, we're going to be talking with Ryan Backer. Ryan is a new friend of mine from the last couple of months. Uh, I've, I've flown in your helicopter a couple of times, even out to my own event, which was really, really cool. We, we hung out at the Muscles House. He's your business partner. You guys just finished putting on that insane, limitless event. Uh, how many people did you have there? Six, 7,000 people there? Almost 8,000. Almost 8,000 people. You had some insane headliners. Uh, I think right now everyone in Utah knows you because people came from out of state and they just kind of, they, 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 they all flock together here. You've had um, nine-figure exits, multiple. It's like super impressive. So you got a great business career, doing a lot of coaching and mentoring. And, you know, aside from that, I think you're a pretty cool guy. It's been great to know you to you as well. Like we've, uh, we've clicked on a, a lot of different fronts, I think. A lot of different businesses. I, the private equity space definitely has like me super intrigued. Two weeks ago, I had you in and I said, Hey, I, it was, it was morning of, it was like super random. I'm like, I just need another successful entrepreneur pair of eyes to just come like sit in on this. And dude, you rearranged your schedule and you sat in and we shark tanked with three of these companies. And, and you and I, we had pretty much the same opinion on all that stuff, which is also interesting to me, yeah. you know, about what those companies were doing and how they could be successful and what they were doing maybe that needed to be changed. So yeah, yeah. I loved, I, I loved, uh, you know, getting a read on your entrepreneurial mind. And, uh, it's funny how, how well we clicked on, on those companies that presented. So here's my question. Like, why are you still in the game? You, I mean, you are young, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people that when they have the kind of exits that you've had, they're like, I'm out. So like, what drives you? Well, I mean, I think I'm a lot like, most entrepreneurs, you know, I've got ADHD. I can't sit still. Um, I will never retire. I, my, I love uh, working my brain and I love business. I love seeing companies grow and scale. It's my passion. It's when when did all that start? Like, like, like rewind me back to the beginning on when you discovered the game of business. So uh, late 90s, uh, the only company I worked for was actually a tech company that came out of the engineering department at Brigham Young University, okay. of all places. Okay. They introduced this groundbreaking hearing aid. And it was the first hearing aid you could program to someone's hearing loss. Now, most hearing aids in the past, you would just turn up all the volume. All the frequencies would be turned up so that you could help people hear. This was a hearing aid where you could actually take data from a hearing test and see what frequencies they were deficient in. And this technology would allow you to raise the volume at the frequencies they were having problems with, like a little equalizer. So this existed and then you got involved? Yeah. So I was one of the first hires. Uh, this was, again, a groundbreaking digital technology. They came to market. They went public. Everybody made a bunch of money. I was a sales rep. I was young. I had no experience in, in audiology or the hearing world. But I got, got in, you know, earned my spurs took a territory up in the Northwest, killed it as a sales rep. And then I realized here I was helping all these audiologists do phenomenally well. Why shouldn't I just do this on my own? And I remember going to my boss two years later and saying, Hey, I'm quitting to start my own audiology business. And he's like, you're an idiot. You're on a fast track. What are you doing? You're making a you know, quarter million dollars a year. You're young. This is, this is your future. And I said, no, it's not. I want to go into the business. And, um, to his surprise, I left the company and went and started my first business. It was actually in Sandy, Utah. We grew to 13 locations. I, Lavelle Edwards was a really close friend of mine. He was also had hearing loss. We got him as our spokesperson. As you know, in Utah, there's God and there's Jesus Christ. And then there was Lavelle Edwards. So right. Yeah. Having so, him as a so, so you got one of the top three. That was awesome. And that skyrocketed the business. And I ended up selling that company in 2000, right before the crash. Thank heavens. Um, and, um, 
you know, that was my first jump into the entrepreneurial world. Did the dot-com bubble affect you at all on, on pricing and exit? Not really. Not, not really. really. We got a really nice exit and I was locked what's a, out. What's a nice exit? Are we like eight figures, nine figures, 10 figures? Uh, like eight figures for that company. We had 15 locations in three okay. states and I did really well on that exit, but I was locked out of the industry for five years. Yeah. They didn't want me to come back in and compete. Okay. Well, at that time, you remember the real estate world took a tank in 2008. Right. And at that time, um, I had a bunch of money and I wanted to parlay that into something in the real estate world. And the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in 2008 closed the first bank and it was in Nevada. It was the first national bank in Nevada. And they were going to take all these toxic assets and then, you know, they're bureaucratic. They don't know how to work through this yeah. stuff. And they were going to partner with the private sector. So my partner and I, submitted the application to become a bidder on these FDIC stressed properties. Yeah. And the first one that they put out was the first national bank in Nevada. And it was a $1.4 billion portfolio. They had lent $701 million and now they had to take and shut down this bank and liquidate all these assets. So Stearns bank got the residential portfolio and we submitted our application and put in our $48 million bid. And somehow me and my business partner won this portfolio. Wait, so real quick. So you got a $1.4 billion portfolio for $48 million. For $48 million. Yep. Okay. And I'm kind of curious because I'm going to tell you something you don't know about me. Awesome. Because uh, in 2009, I went to Freddie and Fannie and instead of buying a bank's assets of commercial real estate, I bought a tape of like 256 single family homes in a bundle at like a 93% discount. And I'm like, I'm going to crush it. I'm going to make millions of dollars. This is amazing. How did your story end? Well, the FDIC gave us seven years to liquidate this portfolio. And when we close, when we won the bid on Friday night, we had a $5 million deposit that was non-refundable and needed to close on $48 million on Monday. And the partner our, our partner in the deal backed out or tried to change the deal us on us on Friday night. And so we had to exit that relationship and in three days find a partner that was willing to fund the balance of wow. $48 million. Wow. In fact, I remember laying on my conference room floor going, oh my gosh, we just totally cut ties with this person who was going to fund this. How are we going to find, you know, $43 million? Well, and it's really, it's really weird because I want to pause because you just ha came off of a really great exit. You're sitting on a ton of money as a young man. And most would be like, bro, go live it up. And you're pulling an <laughs> Elon Musk where you're basically committing all you got and now you're living in a world of stress again. There are some people who would say you're nuts. Oh, well, again, this is the entrepreneurial spirit in me, right? So- Long story short, we called the Sorensen Group, and they were also a bidder on the portfolio. Oh, so since you got they the lost. bids, they, they, you, you pulled them in. We didn't even know they were bidding because Jeez. it was a closed bid, but we, we talked to them, and, and the Sorensen Group came That's in. That's great because they had the, the familiarity on the deal. That's right. Yeah. And so it was, a, it was a match made in heaven. In seven years, we liquidated the entire portfolio, and we ended up recovering 78% for the 78% on 1.4, that means you guys liquidated just over a billion. Well- Set 1.4 billion in paper value, Got 701 in actual money. So 78% of the 700 puts you around 550 or whatever. It was great. Yeah, it was an awesome. So deal. you came in on 50 and you 10x'd. Easy. Yeah. You 10x'd. Yeah, we did it. What, what was harder, 10xing or 2xing? <laughs> oh my gosh. This is a concept I teach a lot about in our coaching group that, uh, you know, to 2x your life is um, that, that's the way, that's the mindset people have. Oh, if I can just do. A little more work if I can just get that raise. Or can, I, I can, can I push back? I don't think anyone's trying to 2x. I think people are like trying to like, okay, this year, if I can get a a 7% raise, if I can just get like a 0.07x. Yeah. They don't even do a 2x. They're not going for a 2x. 2x, by the way, 2x is crazy thinking. They're like, you want to double? You want to double your income? You, 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 you're crazy right. because the most of the known world is just like, my father-in-law, he just finally sold his company, made millions of dollars, but he built it for over 30 years. And I would have these 10x conversations with me. He's like, this year, we're just trying to grow about, you know, five 10%. to 10%. Yeah. And I'm just like, ah, blah. <laughs> like, doesn't that drive you kind of crazy? Like a whole year for 10% growth? But you think it's a mindset shift. You know, I, one of the, a statement I use a lot is um, dream so freaking big that you scare half the people you know. 
and validate the other half that know you. Oh, geez. And so I'm, I'm of the mindset you can go much bigger, much, you know, these impossibly big dreams. And I've done this. All well, you my did life. it, dude. You, you sold at eight figures and then you parlayed with your and other people's money, $48 million. That had to be so ballsy at your age. And <laughs> yeah. then to 10X that plus. Yeah. And I've done that multiple times in my life. And I've just lived by this creed that it's easier to go 10X than it is 2X. Wow. Because when you go 10X, you have to get outside of your normal mindset. You have to change who you are. You have to do something very different to, to take something from a concept to 10 times that concept. And, and the, the, the underlying thought about this is once you learn how to do something and you learn how to do it really well, you can 10X that. Yeah. And I've done that in business. I did that, you know, perfect examples. We just had this, the, the Limitless Arena event. Our largest event prior to that was 700 people. So you literally 10 exit. And so I'm standing in the Maverick Center looking at all the seats, feeling this anxiety, like how are we gonna fill this place? Yeah. But it forces you to step outside of what you think is normal and, and, and possible. And you, and, it's, and, and you put yourself in this mindset that how do we do this? How do we get 7,000 yeah. people? And that's how, how you 10 X your life. I call it the rule of 10. It's known out there as 10 X, but I've done this in the real estate world. I've yeah. done this with limitless society. I've done this with even my hearing centers. The one I just exited my first business I sold in 2007, we had 15 locations. Well, in 2011, and this is what you don't know. When I went back into the industry, I thought, how can I 10 X this? How can I go to 150 locations? And in a 10 year run, that's what we did. We started all over again in the, in the same, audiology world. You, you found same the concept. same model that worked. I'm like, we've built this. And I'll tell you what, the first 20, the first 20 locations was extremely difficult. But then the next 50 and then the next 50 were super easy wow. because we built a system, yeah, built the system to 10X it. So did you exit that company? I did. What did you sell that one for? That one was a nine-figure exit. As so well. you went eight- and then my guess is, I don't know how many partners you had on that that deal, but was that nine for you? Uh, no, I had three partners in that deal. Really great partners. Yeah. That, uh, but you had you got eight figures out of that one. Yes. And then you went nine figures. Mm -hmm. So um, call me crazy, but you're crazy if you're not trying to build something now where you're going for a billion dollar exit. That's the next. Step I mean, ten me. ten is just. Some people are like, why are you doing that? Why are you, you know, you, you, you're crazy to do something like that, but it's actually just natural evolution, yeah. especially when you're in a 10X mindset. 10X took you from eight to nine, 10 is natural. Yeah, I think that's the next step. I'm trying to figure out what that is for me. Um, and I'm really enjoying this coaching space. Limitless Society is a, um, I'm the CEO of that company along with my partner. You guys do have an event coming up. We do. I'm, I'm speaking at it. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us real quick where and when on that one? April 27th at the Maverick Center again. We, and we, uh, how many people are you planning on that one? We're now we're shooting for maximum for what the building will hold, and that's around 10,500. So, got it. So, you're gonna, you're gonna max out that entire arena. We're gonna try to do that for sure. Um, tickets are gonna sell like crazy. That's what happened last time. Are you guys open right now? Yeah, we just went up, went up live on Ticketmaster. You can go to Ticketmaster, search Limitless Arena 2024, or you can go to our website, thelimitlessarena.com. And click on there. There's also a VIP party, which honestly is. I was so at the last VIP party, dude. It was it was fire. By the way, I was there as one of the kind of who's who's, but I was meeting my who's who's. Yeah. So it was it was really cool. Yeah, I think that the the the, uh, the you know landing in the Blackhawk and getting out with Made an Andy Frizzella and Ed Milet. Ed Milet, who's throwing uh, yeah. up like Don't I got you a ever cake in the fr face from Steve Aoki. I mean, it was an off the hook party, but the networking there is just amazing. And that's the night before, and those tickets are also offered on our website as well. The limitless arena, or limitless arena, or sorry, limitlesssociety.com. Who are some of the headliners that you guys have there? I, I don't know what you can announce yet, but yeah. what, what's official? Well, so some of the big names are uh, some of the repeats from last year. Andy Frazella just killed it last year. He's he's going to be our, our keynote speaker. But, you know, we've got um, Keaton Hoskins again. We have um, um, Jim Quick. We have Dean Graziosi. Awesome. We have um, uh, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, awesome. wow. We By the way, I, I actually was at Tony Robbins' house uh, – Speaking to 40 people, I was in his Lions group years ago. It was like the most expensive mastermind on the planet, I think. But I'm sitting there in his home overlooking the ocean there in Florida. 
And Kevin Hart is an amazing speaker. I, like I'll never forget like some of the things that he shared, uh, this gold nugget. He just said, you have to meet every day with reinforced positivity because the negativity is inevitable. Yeah. And when it comes, you're either prepared for it or you're not. And the only way to get prepared is by reinforcing positivity in your life. Yeah. Dean, Dean's advance. amazing. You know, we have some other great speakers, Ed Milet, uh, Renee Rodriguez, who's a great Jeez. speech speaking coach, just yeah, a phenomenal incredible. human being. Uh, and and many others. In our entertainment, we haven't announced yet. But we've got some we've got some people that are gonna uh, some entertainers, well known entertainers that I think are going to blow the roof off. That's, especially that's, the VIP that's event. amazing. I'm 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 really happy for you. That's very very cool. Um, that's going to be that's going to be huge. It's probably going to be the biggest um, kind of motivational speaker entrepreneur training event in all of Utah in 2024. It will be, and and we we found out too that even our September 27th event um, was the largest business conference, personal development conference. It's not just business; it's personal yeah, yeah. development too. Yeah, yeah. The speakers have a, a, a variety of topics, so it's good for everyone, even if you don't own a business. But if you're considering starting a business, or if you are really deep in the personal development side, this is the event for you. Now, you've done some really cool things with your life, Ryan, not just business-wise, right? Like your accomplishments, they're they are noteworthy. And you and I have sat in on some private equity conversations. I know we've got a, a private meeting coming up on, on one of the companies that I think could be potentially huge. But we evaluated another company that we were just texting on that, that I think the data collection space in the medical industry could just be... Oh, that's huge. Data is everything, right? Yeah. Those are, and, those and, are, but those are, but those are 10 figure plays oh, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think uh, that's what I love right now is I love being able to see, get visibility yeah. into some of these companies before they become, you know, massive and, yeah. and they all need, uh, they all need certain principles to, to be applied early on to make them successful for these, you know, larger exits. And, um, I don't know you and I have a knack for kind of seeing those things and also understanding where their pros and cons are. What are some of the things that you look for to determine whether a company is going to go big or not? Well, I think uh, you and I share this similar thought process is, is the team. One of the principles I teach at Limitless Society is, you know, and this is a, a, a book that's well known, it's Who Not How. Yes. One yeah. of the things I, I think, one of the reasons I've been successful is finding the who's in my life. In all of yeah. my companies, I've realized, hey, I'm best suited for these things. Yeah. I can't do these other things. I need a rock star that can do this or do that. I know where my limitations are. I'm a very high level, hot, you know, like 30,000 foot kind of you guy. I see five years down the road, but you need people who are at the best at, you know, whether it's in a CEO function or yeah. CFO function or key people. And that's how I think I've Honestly, that's probably been the biggest secret to my success is yeah. finding the right who's in my life. I, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs get confused with the what as well. They need to like write a sequel book, who not what, because it's like, <laughs> I'm going to invest in this company because the product is so amazing or the service is so amazing. I'm like, yeah, but can the people execute? You, you know, that comes back to that who game of you have to have the who's who because execution is everything. Mm -hmm. the, like ideas are dime a dozen. It's like someone cured cancer. Cool. If they can't get the word out on the street, no one really... I mean, people should care, but if you don't have the word on the street, nobody's going to care. Yeah, and I think I think you can take any business, truly any business, and if you had the right who's, you could make it work. Well, I think one of the biggest problems that most entrepreneurs have is they think they're the who. Yeah. And I'm like, most people that start the party are rarely the people that will actually carry it through. Sometimes they are, but I think a lot of times they get in their own way, and, and um, the creator of an idea – only has so much ability because what they need is an implementer mm -hmm. that knows how to then CEO the crap out of that opportunity. Yeah. And if you ever it. are in a position as an entrepreneur and you think you're the only person that can do what you do, you're wrong. You're so wrong. Yeah. Because there's a thousand people who could do what you're doing better. Better. I know. And finding those people it's an ego is hit. key. It it's, is. It's, it's a an, significant thing. When you're the founder, like I remember when I started my first company and I was like making my business cards. I was just like, am I the president? Am I the founder? And I always thought, you know, there will always be a president or a CEO, but founder. I, and I got really like, I, I got a lot of significance drive on that notion. And I'm so glad these days I don't care to have an office. I don't, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to fancy anything. I don't want a title. Um, I just want to own stuff. Yeah. I want to control stuff and I want to create impact in the world. And if I have a title, it always shrinks my impact. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, you look at someone like Bill Gates, who is not the CEO, you know, of his company, but he's like the chief architect. He's that visionary, right? Yeah. And if he were to put himself into the role of doing the the day-to-day operational stuff, he wouldn't have been able to bring out mm-hmm. the brilliant sort of co- source code, all the things that the future of that company. And so placing yourself in the right position in your own company is really important. And generally speaking, most founders are not CEOs. Yeah. So I want to ask you, are you one of these entrepreneurs that's like, oh yeah, I'm that 80 hour a week guy, like grind it out. That's, that's what it is. Cause there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have this grinding mindset do you have that mindset? Have you ever had that mindset? How are you operating today? I've been the 80 hour guy, but I've also learned, you know, that, and one of the skill sets I think that I, I teach a lot is time boxing. I try to, I try to compress what I want to do into very short segments of time where I'm super productive and then give myself a break. I'm, I'm the, work hard, play hard kind of guy. Cause I need those, that can recharge you, of my batteries. Can you share that balance? Like, like how much do you like to work and how much do you need to play to feel balanced? Well, for me, definitely I'm going to give a 40 to 60 hour week. And I think if I can't do my job in that amount of time that I don't have enough who's in my life Got it. and, and I won't, I won't be as productive unless yeah. I'm having some of that work life balance. Right. But for me, time boxing is, If you give yourself an hour to do a a job, you're probably going to take that whole hour to do that job. If you, if that's the way you think, but if you can compress those, those workloads into more, you know, tight time boxes, you'll be surprised what you thought you could do in an hour. You can do in 20 minutes. That's interesting. And so I really focus on that and I focus on the one thing I can do today. And when I get that done, it often leads me to the next one thing I can do today. And so I, you're so you're a weird entrepreneur because most entrepreneurs are ADHD, mm-hmm. but you seem to have a hyper focus disorder. Yeah, it is. And if I compress those things and I work really hard for that period of time and I give myself a break, and then I and then I have meaningful outside of work activities, that's when I know I'm going to give my best work. Yeah. And compress it into 40 hours instead of stretching those things out to say 80 hours a week. I can't, I can't do that lifestyle because I will, something will be off balance yeah. in my life. And that's one of the principles we teach at Limitless Society is you do have to have, you know, five principles that we teach just yeah, is physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and financial. We teach that there's a balance or harmony in all those five things in your life. If one or two of those things is out of whack, generally you're not going to be as efficient in the other areas where perhaps you are very efficient. So, so what do you do when you have a member of your limitless society who's fat? Well, one of the things we teach is that your physical health is super important for your overall general health. You know, your ability to focus, your ability to work, your ability to, to be the best dad, the best, you know, uh, business partner, all of those things. So we teach those principles of health. You know, um, this isn't uncommon. We see this becoming a a lot more of what people are teaching about that your physical health is directly tied to your output on your business and your, you know, uh, the other parts of your life. Why spirituality? Like, don't you think there's a lot of people like, Hey, isn't that private, personal, none of your business? What, what, what does that fit in? I definitely think that spirituality is, 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 is more of a personal thing, but spirituality doesn't mean you have to believe in God. It can be connecting with nature or, do you know, like, like as a person being a good human being, you know? So, I mean, you could, you can, you could be any religion. We just teach that there are, there are principles of that spiritual side, whether it's connection to the universe or connection to a higher power or deity that I think is very important to play to, to play in the balance of and harmony of your entrepreneurial journey or your journey as a human. I don't disagree, but I want to know why for you personally. Like, well, so I I get a lot of strength from knowing that there is um, intelligent design out there. That there's this this being who created us. I do not believe that we just appeared on the scene in the universe uh, because of happenstance. I believe that there is a higher power and that we can also tap into that higher power um, in the way that we believe in that higher power to help us, you know, become a better version of ourself. Hmm. You, uh, when you're not working, you, you have some, you've done some interesting things with your life. 2017, 
you were part of a pretty famous sting operation that Tony Robbins also went undercover for. I'm assuming it was your connections and maybe your success in business that put you in that situation, but you were part of that undercover team and rescued so 34 kids. Yeah. Dude, can you, I know it's a heavy, sex trafficking is a heavy conversation piece. I just got back from Guatemala. Um, there's an organization out there that we support. They've got 61 children. And just two weeks ago, they took in their most recent child, uh, an 18 month old that they pulled out of a hospital with internal bleeding from sex trafficking. I mean, it's just, you and I have this connection and you know, I have children and, um, in 2017, a friend of mine came to me and said, Hey, look, you're a successful businessman. You speak multiple languages. You know how to work overseas. He says, you actually fit the, the profile. So you the, were headhunted. I was headhunted. Jeez. You fit the profile of a typical person who's out trafficking children. The, mm-hmm. Like I can't remember the the data, but like eighty percent of the worldwide demand in child sex trafficking is U.S. businessmen, and so I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> like you? I fit this profile really well. Do you want to come and help us find these kids and rescue these kids?" And uh, I trained for about a year on on some of the tactics and things that you do and how you lure in these people that are um, trafficking children. And we were very successful for multiple years. There's a lot of great success that we had. Uh, there was some definitely some cons of being in that, some personal things. There's a couple of things I wish I could unsee in my brain. And I hope, I hope God one day pulls those out of my mind because they're very, very hard, impossibly hard things to imagine that a human being can do to another these, human being. These are the things that just break your heart. Yeah, absolutely break my I, heart. I've got a buddy of mine who... Pete Vargas, he says, you need to find the thing in life that breaks your heart because it will give you all the motivation that you need to create the solution. So, so, you know, being part of that, I was, you know, I, um, was super rewarding in my life, but it was also very challenging, um, uh, to see that side of, uh, human beings and what they can do to each other. And, um, you know, kudos to all the organizations that uh, help fight that initiative, and um, which is the largest criminal enterprise in the world. You know, I have daughters, and I just, I at the time, I was like, what would I do yeah. if my daughter had been trafficked? What yeah. would I be willing to do? Yeah. And uh, I played a small role in that for for multiple years, but um, that's you know, beautiful. that that is a that's a that's a big negative thing in society today that's that's happening every day yeah i want to ask you um when you look at your life today from when you were involved in that um i'm always fascinated to kind of talk to people that live the life and had the experience with the time that you spent in that space where does it put you today in in your life as a man um like, how does that affect you on a daily basis with what you witnessed and saw? I think it just makes me appreciate um, sort of the simplicity of life. And, um, you know, when when I travel to a foreign country and I see, see especially a third world country, where you see people living in, in conditions that are um, challenging. And, and then you also understand how the criminal organization swoops into those areas and it targets those areas, especially Mexico, um, you know, any of the uh, island areas, anywhere where there's a, a beach that trafficking takes place. And so usually, um, you know, uh, those traffickers swoop into those areas and find find these vulnerable people, vulnerable children. In Haiti, for example, it was the earthquake that killed a bunch of the parents and these kids are running around aimlessly. And so these traffickers are like, Oh, boom, boom, let's take these kids in and we'll create this, this great criminal organization. And so I think perspective wise, it's, it's, (laughs) boy, it's made me appreciate my own kids. It's made me think differently about, you know, um, being a parent, um, and made me think differently about what human beings are capable of of good and bad. I, um, in a lifetime, you can only master so many things. And I'm like, shoot, you got to be really careful. Like, for example, if I was like an auto mechanic, like, yeah, I mastered fixing cars. I don't want to trivialize that, but that's useful for a career. And then if your car breaks down, you get a benefit. But if you want a more impactful life, you have to be a little bit choosier on what you want to master. And I always tell people, I think that the one thing everyone should master is money. Um, 
not so that you become obsessed with it, the pursuit of it, and always upgrading materialistically into nicer lifestyle, but rather because money, money is the ultimate enabler of all things. Like more money just equals more options. Most people think more money, more problems. That's what poor people tell themselves. Mm-hmm. More money, more options. Um, this last year, I went to Ukraine three times. And um, I love to invite people to prosper and do well financially um, for a couple of reasons. But one of them is it's really cool when you have an opportunity to start using not just time and your talent, but also money for doing something really impactful. And I brought 10 entrepreneurs on my on my first trip to Ukraine. Uh, they each donated $100,000. It was just a really generous group of people. We brought a million dollars of medical supplies in specifically for kids that they weren't able to transport out of country to get life-saving surgeries uh, because they didn't have all the proper medical equipment. So we basically brought in the medical equipment. And um, I did not know how that experience was going to change my heart, mm-hmm. but it did. And in a very addictive kind of way, like the truth is I... I considered myself before a little bit self-interested and more selfish, like, hey, I'm building wealth for me. I I have a foundation, like we want to help people. But uh, if I'm being really honest with myself, I'm like, I'm enjoying a lot of this money. Mm-hmm. I'm enjoying a lot of the fruits of my labors. And when I went to Ukraine, I went there because I felt called to be there. It was like this feeling in my heart. And by the time I came back, my heart had broken so many times and had grown back stronger that we ended up going back and back and now we're adopting orphanages and just doing different things because um, I want everything that life has to offer. And if a person can figure out the money game, then you can start trading it for things beyond just you know, mansions and jets and, and trips and really nice excursions. There's nothing wrong with those things, but I do honestly believe that when we get on our deathbed, we're going to look back at our life and we're going to say, what am I most proud of? Mm-hmm. And who did I become in the journey of what I pursued? I'm kind of curious at your age, what do I think about that? Yeah, I, who, I, who are I, you becoming? Who do you who do you hope to be on your own deathbed? Well, deathbed. so in regards to money, and this may be strange, but I don't think of that as mine. I think I'm a steward of of it. Stewardship, I'm, you know, better off because of it. But if you look at all the really really wealthy people, they they're they're figuring out how to wait, ways how to give it all away or yeah. give so much of it away. It, yeah. It's really I don't really look at it as mine. But I look at it as, okay, this can create an opportunity for me to provide provide myself, what I know, what I've learned back to the yeah. community, back to the places I live and serve and figure out a way to take that money and make it better. I, I always say this too, you know, money doesn't make you happy, but it makes happy people happier. <laughs> like It's a it, magnifier, right? It, it is a magnifier. Yeah. And if you can figure out a way to give back... I don't really look at that money as just my own. You know? that, was a, that was a Tony Robbins phrase that I really liked that I picked up years ago. He says, the secret to living is giving. Yeah. Right? And it's like this journey where we start off very significance-driven as people like, I want to be important. I want to be seen and I want to be acknowledged. I want to be recognized. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a very basic drive for a lot of humans. But at some point, it really is selfish. It's really all about, um, at first it might be insecurity. I want to know that I'm enough. I want to know that I made a difference. I want to know that I, that my life was worth it, but then it can turn egotistically into a game of it's all about me. And, and, um, and it feels good to be famous or rich or wealthy and be able to do things. Those are games. I think of a, of a less developed human being that's in their evolutionary game. And ultimately if we trade that for, um, giving back contribution, making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Like there's a really cool sustaining energy that comes off of doing that kind of work. So I like your, I I resonate with what you're saying there about it being a stewardship. Just kind of going back real quick, Tim Ballard, a lot of heat in the press. I had a buddy of mine that booked him to speak at his conference and he canceled him because it was just so controversial. I know that when his, when his movie originally came out, I mean, it was amazing how many people put up walls for the sound of freedom not to air Mm -hmm. um i went and saw it and i found it to be incredibly you know moving and inspiring and i'm like okay this work this invites people to look at this awful problem Mm -hmm. 
and hopefully creates awareness where people want to do something about it. Um, wh where are you at since you were with Tim Ballard's organization, Underground Railroad? Like, wh what do you think about everything that's happening? What I could say about Tim, and and I can say this with all honesty, I I, I never saw any of the things that have been purported uh, about him. I was with him frequently, and I just I never saw any of that. So I I, I hope I, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, just the way, you know, I, I can't turn a blind eye to anybody that's making some accusations. I, I, I hope, I hope that that isn't true. I hope it isn't, you know, but do you I think there's a conspiracy theory here? I, I couldn't say that there is that there, or that there isn't, but I do know that, um, um, I've seen what people can do in life, the, the worst of the worst. And, uh, you know, I can't put anything past anybody, but yeah. I can honestly say I never saw any of the things that okay. uh, that 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 he's was being. it kind of like emotional for you and all that Absol allegation came out absolutely absolutely um, you know um, and I had the same emotion about the people who came forward mm. you know so uh, you, you know, just don't know what's really going I don't, on but I don't you... and I'm sure that with time um, that will all come forward so um, I want the best for everybody involved yeah. obviously but I don't want it to take away from the the impact yeah. and and what is going on in this world relative yeah. to human trafficking and it it is a very real deep dark nasty place and it is happening yeah. daily yeah mm. so thank you i really appreciate that it was it was humbling to go through i was in vegas yesterday speaking at an event and uh seeing the posters up all over the airport for just help end sex trafficking in the u.s and it was just like thank you for the reminder that that happens here that our children are not as safe as we would think. And they're not, definitely not. That, when Liam Neeson, that movie came out taken, I think every dad with a daughter watched that probably multiple times. I did and uh, would rile me up every single time. What, what would you do? What would you do for a loved one? So the interesting, the interest, I would do anything. I mean, I would go to the recesses of hell to bring my kids back. And I, I have had the unfortunate, um, um, you know, view into that world that, that that view that was expressed in the movie taken i've seen that i've seen kids with numbers on them behind a, a pane of glass that that is real yeah. it happens and um you know i, I think the, the good people that are involved in all of these nonprofit uh, organizations who are trying to tackle that problem i mean more power to them yeah so I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit, um, because there, I, there's some more of these entrepreneurial hacks I want to get to, but I also just want to talk about, um, there are some perks that come with being a successful entrepreneur. It, you know, more money, more options. It gives you the opportunity to do some cool things with your life, things that inspire, right? Things that really kind of, um, you know, and, and when I met you, it was helicopter driven. And it's just like, I'm thinking about getting my license. I'm thinking about, you know, getting into that game. Um, I've got an addition on my house I'm building where I've got a nice, you know, helicopter There's spot and a place to land. And I'm like, <laughs> and and honestly, flying with you a couple of times was very, very inspiring. I love it. Anytime that anybody jumps into the helicopter with me, yeah. they're putting their their lives in my hand. I take that very seriously. Just yes. FYI. Like, no, I know. I felt you were it's very, very safe. It's yeah. very safe, but, but yeah, it's a I responsibility. Mean, it is a responsibility. So kind of curious, um, you've been in that game for what, seven years, mm -hmm. you've been, you right, right. Choppering around. I'm kind of curious. Do you do that for pleasure? Do you do it for fun or you do it, do it for efficiency? What, what drives that for you? Well, maybe if I shared with you the whole reason for me becoming a helicopter pilot in the first place, will give you kind of an, an, an idea on this. I had two terrible, terrible concussions in 2012 and 2013 traumatic brain injury like these are like car accidents uh one was in a motocross accident on oh. a motocross track in southern california someone hit me in the air off a hundred hundred foot jump i spun around cracked my helmet ear to ear landed not on my bike um, had all the concussion related issues that went away a year later in a wind and a skydiving tunnel i had I hit my head in the exact same spot thought I broke my neck because I felt what, what I thought was acid running down my spine. And I thought any minute I'm going to be a quadriplegic. Well, those two concussions a year apart at 39 and 40, your brain doesn't heal very fast. It heals at 12 and 13. But as you get older, the brain takes time to heal. 
Well, I was struggling. I don't, a year after the second concussion, I thought, am I having a midlife crisis? I couldn't focus. I couldn't sleep. You know, I was depressed and I'm not someone that was ever depressed. People saw a visual change in my countenance. Something was wrong with me, but I did not know what was wrong. And after a couple of years of floundering around and meeting with a psychiatrist, I eventually ended up with the psychiatrist who after 12 sessions, he's like, you don't have any of these typical telltale problems. Have you ever had a concussion? I'm like, yeah, I had two really bad ones. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You are in the wrong spot. They sent me to California, had my brain scanned, and sure enough, at this renowned institute where they've scanned hundreds of thousands of brains, car accident victims, Alzheimer's patients, drug addicts, all kinds of weird. They got you, know, you diagnosed up. And they diagnosed me. And sure enough, I had my brain was not behaving correctly. And so finally I had this like answer because prior to that, just the doctors, sense. the doctor's been treating me. Oh, you can't sleep. You need Ambien. Oh, you can't focus. How about Adderall? Oh, you are depressed. How about this? They were treating the symptoms, but not the underlying not the cause. Problem. So of all places, I went for like a three year, you know, mission, NFL concussion center, New York, LA, all over the country, trying to get treatment for this brain injury. And I had someone that came to me and said, oh, my son fell off his, my grandson fell off his bike. He was a concert pianist and uh, an A student, but now he doesn't do anything. He had this concussion, but we sent him to this place in Provo. Are you kidding? Right in your backyard? And I'm like, I've been all right over in your the backyard? country. Yeah, I'm like, this is, this can't be. But I was committed to this process, right? So you said, I'll, I'll open that door. That's right. And it actually was funded by one of the people that funded was Austin Collie, who played at BYU and had a career ending concussion in the NFL. Got it. Wow. So this facility opens, they're treating all these people and I go down for 5 days and they're they're like, "Yeah, we're going to we're going to reconnect all these pathways in your brain in 5 5 days." And what do you think I thought? They're like, "Okay. Okay, it's been sounds, 5 years." Sounds good. Okay. Here's the snake I'm like, oil. I'm committed. First day in, I'm like, "This is BS. Yeah. I cannot do this. Nobody can do these therapies. It's impossible." Like I was so stressed out. It was so taxing on me emotionally and mentally, you know, and I, and I barely made it through the first day. Real quick, this has something to do with helicopters? Yeah, it does. Okay, keep going. Five days later, after the treatments, they tested me again, and I was back to what they call normal. And I felt amazing. Wow. I mean, I felt Jeez. like, I'm back. Like, holy crap, this is me. Jeez, if there's anyone with a uh, head trauma that's listening to this, can you tell us? Trust me, cognitive oh. FX. Cognitive right. FX. Look Got them up. It. Anyways, yeah. walking out the door, I remember the doors opening as I'm walking out, and I'm feeling amazing. And the first thing I tell myself is, I, I don't think this is like a placebo effect. I think this is real. What's the hardest thing I can do? What's the most taxing thing that I could possibly do to prove that I'm back? And I'd always wanted to fly a helicopter and I went and enrolled that day. That would have been really stressful and difficult if you hadn't fixed that. I Trust me, I was on the verge of like, I mean, I was contemplating suicide. This was not a good period of my time, wow. my life. Wow, serious. And so, Flying a helicopter for me is this overcoming of these head this head injury that I oh, head it's total that proof. I Every time it I looks kind of complicated, right? I'm like, trust you me. got foot pedals and you got all sorts of flying is the easy part. It was the memorization. It was all the, the the laws and all of the you know like maneuvers and all that stuff. It was very taxing to get through, but I would not have made it through that. So I was back, and the helicopter for me is a testament of overcoming something that was very challenging in my life. Wow. So, so that that's was, why I fly helicopters. That's why you fly helicopters. It was like the the final proof yep. that it was permanent. That's right. None of those symptoms ever came back. No, dude. I, I I feel like I I feel like I was not only given a new chance on life, but I feel like I'm better wow. because of it. Yeah. Being a being a successful entrepreneur does give you access to a couple of things. World class food, world class destinations. Just out of curiosity, favorite favorite places, favorite adventures, things right. that you've done. And I do want to say yeah. your two concussions. Those were unfortunately like byproducts of your choices, oh, right? Oh yeah, no, one no. was a motocross, and, and the other one was a yeah. skydiving wind tunnel. Yeah, I'm like, huh. that's been my life. I mean, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Okay, right? are you really? Oh yes. Some absolutely. people say it like you love the adrenaline. Oh, anything, anything like have that. Have you been down with Brian to do the Baja? I have. Are I'm you going, gonna do it? I'm going again in March. On March. 8th. I'm going in March, dude. I'm going in March. <laughs> this is gonna be awesome. Okay, one of the greatest experiences I've had, but. It's funny when you mentioned Brian, um, I've traveled some, to some of the most amazing places with Brian. Well, you've and, hiked some crazy mountains. Oh, I have. What and have you done? I, so Aconcagua is in Argentina. It's the highest peak outside the Himalayas. 
Okay, so that's the highest peak, outside of, which also means that that's the mountain for South America. That's right, and it's one of the seven summits, and very challenging. You know, more not not like where you're in ice axes, and you know, it's it's a uh, you know rise up from basically sea level to twenty four thousand feet. It was a it's a big mountain. In fact, when I saw the mountain, it's the largest object I have ever seen on wow. Earth. I mean, it is so big and so overwhelming, but. Yeah. Anyway, so I've done that. Uh, probably one of my favorite trips uh, was the Galapagos. I know you've been there. Oh, that dude, was... Galapagos was epic. Did you guys rent, like, get a yacht? We got a yacht. We did oh, the tour. It was oof. like being at, at the dawn of time with the animals. Yes. I remember sitting on the beach, and the animals don't differentiate you from anybody else because they don't really know what you are. So birds are landing on my hands. I, I feel like Ace Ventura in the movie Pet Detective. Right? <laughs> like I'm sitting there like, oh. You know, like uh, animals are coming up to you. And it was just crazy to see the evolution, evolutionary page yeah. in the world right there in the Galapagos. So we got this 145 foot yacht and it came with, with private crew and chef and all of that. And I've got my family, my four kids, my wife, and I've got our nanny, um, you know, because this is school for my kids. This is kind of what we do with world school sometimes. Mm -hmm. Pull my kids out of the public school system for a number of reasons. But one of them was they would always give me flack when I wanted to give my children an experience that anyone would consider amazing education because it wasn't sitting in a classroom on a certain day of the week reading a textbook. I'm like, no, nah, we're just gonna go out. And and we had the most, like, I, we were on this one private secluded beach after snorkeling and we had these sea lions, um, seals, sorry, come up on the beach and put on the craziest show for us. And the naturalist is saying, hey, don't touch them but they wanted to come up and touch us. They were doing backflips. Like it was, it was, it was so wild and surreal. We, we were in this coral reef snorkeling with like hundreds of sea turtles. So insanely memorable. Sharks. Did you guys swim with sharks? Oh my gosh, we were in a we were in a school of hammerheads just sitting down on the what, bottom. What's what's the school of hammerheads? Uh, hammerhead sharks. Are these like know, how many? I, I don't know. I I was it was innumerable. I couldn't count them. I'm sure it was uh, five hundred. Jeez. And, and, and the, you know, the Galapagos sharks and penguins yep. were so curious. They would yes. swim right up to you and just be like, you're What's not up? a threat to me. Yep. And it's weird on that, on that island change, yep. the, the animals just, they don't see you any differently than no, any, and, anybody else. And the iguanas trippy when you would see like thousands of iguanas? Yeah. <laughs> wild, right? Just wild. No, very, very cool species, very cool animals. But that kind of trip was so my... So yeah, speed. I saw that you went there and I wanted to remark on that, but probably my favorite place in the world I ever went was the largest cave in the world that they just discovered a few years ago Series? called the Som Dung Cave in Vietnam. Wow. And when I say cave, I mean, this is like epically big, like a 747 can fit under there. And they, the opening you go in is no bigger than a doorway, but you go descend down and we were five days underground hiking through this underground Are you cave. serious? Wow. And the interesting thing, I got to just tell this one story. You know what a stalactite is, right? Yes. Or, a, a, you stalagmite. know, a stalagmite from the floor, stalactite. So there was columns yep. that had formed from the ceiling to the floor. And we're talking eight, 900 foot tall columns. No way. And the, the geologists that were there with us say, these columns grow at a certain amount per year. Yeah. And he says, so that column right there is 450 million years old. Oh my gosh. It was like walking into a time capsule. Wow. Okay. There were cave pearls on the ground, which are these little balls that form up, little rocks, and they sit there and spin in a little dish over 10,000, 50,000 years. And one cave pearl, which is a perfect, looks like a cue ball, you pick that up out of its little dish where it's been spinning for, and a cave pearl like that is 100,000 years old. Wow. That thing has not moved for 100,000 years. That's insane. And when you lift that up, can you imagine that feeling like, I just oh, took yeah. this thing out of its little space that's been there forever. And I, you're not supposed to take any home. Did you? But I put one in my mouth, a smaller one that was like 10,000 years old because I had to have one of these cave pearls. <laughs> okay. Hopefully the Viet uh, Vietnamese government doesn't <laughs> come after me. But you're, you're busted. It was, it was amazing. That, that was an adventure of a lifetime that uh, you know, one day I'd like to take people back to, but yeah. uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, I try to have an adventure of a lifetime every week. Okay, well, let's Can't do it. Can't always travel somewhere, <laughs> but yes. Well, I think Brian like has me like sold on the, well, we're gonna own choppers together and we're going Baja. to- And we're gonna do the seven, you know, we're gonna summits. do the peaks of the seven summits hey, and I'm North and South Pole. And we're, I'm like, dude, that's, that's my jam. So I'm, I'm in. My wife's not. 
Yeah, of course. She's like Everest. No, and I'm they're like, smart. Yes. They're She's the smart like, no. ones. In our I know relationships. they are. So <laughs> we'll uh, we'll try to make her feel good. Um, man, um, so cool. So I kind of want to wrap up with this idea right here. You've you've uh, you've lived a lot of life. You've you've done a lot of really impressive things, Ryan. Really, really cool. Uh, also, just I like you as a human being. Like I I. I when you get to a certain level of, I, I think, success, y- y- you elevate your standards and it's like, why would I spend time with the jackasses? Like, I want to spend time with people that I respect, people that I love, or people that I appreciate. I just want to share with you, I, I like you as a human being. Like, well, you have a good energy and, and you've done some really cool things. And also, it sounds like you've done a lot of really good impact work on the planet, which is really commendable. Yeah. And I, you know, Chris, I look up to you too. Uh, stuff that you're doing in your world, in your space, you know, it's, it's a very commendable and I, and I, I think that's why we, we bonded so quickly, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's fun to be around like-minded people. I've got some entrepreneurs. Thank you. That, that are going to be listening to this. And I'm kind of, kind of curious. Um, I want to get three hacks from you, like mm-hmm. for the entrepreneur listening that says, okay, this dude, I haven't had my multiple nine figure exits yet. Um, and everyone's, I'm sure learning a ton from just who you are as a human being and, and hopefully everyone get, does get a chance, you know, to come in town and attend this 10,000 person, amazing limitless event. That's cool. Personal development business conference. That's huge. That's big. It's ballsy. I love your 10 X approach to life. Three hacks for the entrepreneur listening on that would help them skip just the initial years of doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. So for me, number one, time is the most valuable commodity that we have. I truly believe that not money. Not money. It's time. It's time. Yeah. You know, if I said to you tomorrow, and then you hear this on a lot of podcasts, hey, I'll give you $10 million a day, but you're going to die tomorrow. You'd be like, nope. Hell no. Right. Nope. So, uh, with time is our most valuable resource. And I think most people don't use their time the most efficiently. And if you really studied what you do during a week or a month or a, you know, so you look for a waste. Year, yeah. I'm looking for where am I wasting my time? Mm. Right. And, uh, this, uh, this, uh, thing that we talked about earlier, time boxing is a way for me, yeah. it works for me. It may not be everybody else's life hack, but for me to compress what would normally take me, yeah. may, or I would allow myself a certain amount of time to do, I compress yeah. it down and I'm surprised at how much more efficient I am with time. That's probably why, hey, if I can be more efficient with my time and working, I can also do the things that I really love to do and not be stressed out about it. So, so. Actually, I actually really like that hack. Um, I do this thing called instant implementation. I used to keep lists of like, oh, remember to do this later. And I would keep a to-do list. And the majority of things on a to-do list for me take like two minutes. It's send a text, send an email, communicate something, ignite something, start something, put people together, et cetera. And at some point I started, I think on this hack where I was just like, you know what? It's really inefficient to keep a list and then to book time later and to do it. And it became way more efficient just to start doing this thing called instant implementation. Yeah, is that kind of like... Like for me, I think of that as do it now. Yes, do it now. Do it now. And and I think that's where people stall out, especially entrepreneurs. Um, doing it now means t- especially taking the hard things and getting those done. The things you push off, the things you, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be more efficient with my time. I'm trying to force myself to be, to look at my overall time and how I use it and how to be the most efficient. But so you number know, one, valuing your time. Valuing your most time. A, most biggest asset. I think you really have to look at that. Number two? Uh, number two um, is I um, – number two would probably have to be, you know, um, and I use this phrase a lot too, is, you know, jump off the cliff and grow wings on the way down. Mm. For the entrepreneurs that I, that I mentor, a lot of them just – can't get to that point where they're like, oh, have I have I figured this all out? Have I they want have the I whole business book. plan? They want this the whole all playbook. Out? Yeah, and, they want to know everything and first. You literally, I've yeah. found that anytime I jump off the cliff and grow my wings on the way down, you'll figure it out. But starting is where people struggle. Stop. Yeah, yeah. They just they wait. They stand there. They're like, okay, there's this big abyss. I'm gonna jump off into. Oh, do I have this all right? So I, so you know, jump off the cliff grow wings on the way down and, and whatever that means to you and and, and applies to you, that's, that's where people make the biggest, you know, change in their lives is, is doing something 
without having the complete picture in front yeah. of them. We also, you, if you don't start, you can't get momentum. And momentum is what creates ease after the difficulty, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the flywheel principle. It's hard to start, but then it gets faster. I was talking to Carlos Reyes um, last year, and he was telling me that he was visiting Sedona with one of his mentors, and they wanted to go hike Bell Rock. And Bell Rock is this, it's this kind of bell-shaped rock, and it was in the snow, and there was this slippery part. And so his mentor had basically gone up to a really challenging spot and was trying to encourage Carlos and Carlos would get kind of get to the slippery spot and he'd slow down, but then he didn't have the momentum to actually make it, make it up to the top. And his mentor shouts down, Carlos, stop stopping. And on his next go, he made it right up. <laughs> and I think that sometimes we have a hard time getting started, but then we don't get momentum because we stop. And that's kind of become for me also just this adage in my mind, stop stopping. Yeah. Just stop yeah. stopping. What you're doing is working. For some reason, I think we're afraid of results or greatness or winning or whatever, or we're playing not to lose instead of playing to win. And we, we just program stopping. Yeah. And I tell this a lot too. This is probably the third thing is I've, I've failed as many times as I have succeeded. And those failures have led me to a knowledge that I wouldn't have ever learned before and changes that I've made to myself later on. Um, but do you, do you consider it failing? I mean, I, failure, in your head, right? Failure is the word we use. There's a lot of people like, oh, I've got this failure complex. I tried three times. It didn't work out. I gave up. And I'm like, but I look at it as put a, some energy on that. It's a lesson. Okay. You know, you go to school to learn things. You have lessons to learn things. And, and it's the failures in life that teach us lessons that help us become better. And I, yeah. and, um, I, I think people don't dream big enough. Yeah. Um, and it's the impossibly big dreams that we need to be dreaming. It's a mindset it shift. It goes back to your 10X. Yeah, it, it is. Go um, big or go home. You know, you can never expect to surpass your own self-perception. So if you perceive yourself as this and only this, you will never surpass that. Whoa, whoa. Can we back up on that? That was like, I think, my favorite part of our conversation today. You can never expect to surpass your own self-perception. So basically, however you perceive yourself limited, you'll never exceed it. Never. Which means you have to, oh, uh, is that why you call it limitless? And that's why. Limitless society is about being something more than you think you can possibly yeah, be. A, yeah. And we teach people how to do that. But a lot of people's uh, inability to become something that, that maybe they dream about their perceptions of themselves limit what they can do. And if yeah. you can't dream big enough, or if you can't get through the self-defeating taught beliefs that were instilled in you at a very early age, you'll never get there. So you have to learn to break down those, those, those limiting beliefs, that self-perception that you may have about yourself so you can break through that ceiling and go to the next level. Love it, brother. Brother, it's been awesome having you here today. Uh, listen, you've got the Limitless Arena coming up. People can go to the limitlessarena.com the and limitless buy tickets arena. or a ticket master and just search under limitless arena. Awesome. Well, I love, I love how you bring incredible people together. I, uh, I have a feeling we're going to participate in quite a few businesses together. We're going to have some fun playing in the PE space. And I think we're going to hike some mountains together too. I love it. Let's go climb some big ones. Let's climb some big ones for everyone listening. You've been listening to the Chris Crohn show. Go live an epic limitless life. Go 10 X, go big. Do it like Ryan. Thank you.